Hey, it's Lisa Wimberger here. I'm the founder of Neurosculpting and I have helped thousands of people learn really powerful tools to regulate their minds and their bodies, including pro athletes, entrepreneurs, and those with serious stress-based illnesses. So I'm really excited to help you do the very same thing through education and some incredible guest experts. And together, we're going to discover the formula to unlock hope. So welcome. Hey, so I am so stoked to be talking to Dave Asprey, who is not only a brilliant thought leader, but also very inspirational to me. So I want to read a little bit of his bio and then we'll jump into some really juicy conversation. So he is a four times New York Times bestselling author, but I suspect it'll be five after this next book. Um, host of the Webby Award winning podcast, The Human Upgrade, and he is considered the father of biohacking, which is a term that pretty much everyone uses now who's into wellness. And, um, and we're going to talk a little bit today about about his uh, new book, Smarter, Not Harder. And we'll talk about all sorts of other things that just organically come up in the conversation. So Dave, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. Lisa, it's good to see you again. It's been a while since I interviewed you on my show. Yes. Thanks for having me on yours. Yeah, it's been a while. So um, I'm not done with Smarter, Not Harder. I'm in it. But I am... I have like pages and pages of notes and I'm taking notes because literally every paragraph in this book is inspiring me to think about something I can tweak or, um, or validating something I'm already doing. It's just, it, for me, it's very hopeful, but I want to talk to you about this brilliant concept that laziness is a really good thing. I'm totally (laughs) embracing it. And I, I would love for you to just say a little bit about what, what do you, what do you mean? Why are we okay. allowed suddenly allowed to be lazy? This will be fun because you have a, a really nuanced uh, understanding of psychology and some of the unconscious things uh, just because of, of your body of work. So since we're little kids, we don't want to do hard stuff. Like laying on the couch is easier than going outside and moving. It just is right. And, So then your parents yell at you and say, don't be so lazy. And then you don't actually want to study. So you don't, you fail a test. Don't be so lazy, says the teacher. And then of course you get some extra shame from the priest. Don't be so lazy. So then you develop shame and guilt, Hmm. right? And those are things that hold everyone back. But if you look at the way biology works, the most important thing that your body worries about right after getting eaten by tigers, you know, immediate death is running out of energy. Mm-hmm. And that can come in the form of eating everything. And it can also come in the form of just not using too much energy. And that's why the body tells you anytime you try to do something that takes extra electricity, like running or exercising, or even just applying yourself, it's like, don't do that. And the underlying message is you might run out of calories and starve to death because who knows if there's more food. This is your body making you feel that way. It's not you choosing it. It's a natural and inborn part of all life is to, is to conserve energy. So we've developed guilt because of a Puritan work ethic over a natural and actually very beneficial aspect of being a human. And think about it. Every innovation in all of human history comes from laziness. I love this idea because that's not what we're cultured to think, right? We're cultured to think that um, innovation comes from, you know, working super hard and exhausting yourself. And, uh, but you're saying innovation comes from laziness and that- It's total bullshit. If, If innovation came from working hard, we'd all be standing behind plows for 12 hours a day, pushing as hard as we could push so we could work really hard. And some lazy ass farmers like, you know what, like, what if I had, you know, something else besides a cow? Cause I really don't like pushing. Like I'm going to sit my fat ass on a tractor cause it's less work. I'll invent a tractor. Like this is how invention happens. And people are like, Dave, you've built a hundred million dollar company and you run a neuroscience company and you have eight other things and five New York times bestsellers and, and a 300 million download podcast and blah, 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 and whatever else they think I'm doing that I'm probably not even doing. I'm like, it's because I'm lazy. I just don't want to do hard stuff. So I get people to help me. And, and I, I just wanted the stuff to exist. And I didn't want to meditate in a cave for 40 years because I wanted to watch Netflix. 
<laughs> so I found a way to do it faster with neurofeedback. It's not that hard. I am lazy, lazy, lazy. That's why I'm successful. And so yeah. I'm not guilty about that. And I'm like, people on my team try and make me do stuff. I'm like, you do it. Gross. <laughs> That's why I hired you. Um, <laughs> you know, I feel like people, seriously, if people could really wrap their minds around energy efficiency is the name of the game, right? And that's how I'm converting it, right? So yeah. because some people still have that shame and guilt around laziness, and for those of you listening, if you're stuck on the term, just it's energy efficiency. And you're giving us permission not to feel guilty about our natural des nervous system design of efficiency, Oh my God, that's a game changer. This has been my uphill battle. It's trying yeah. to get people to understand you don't have to meditate on the mountaintop for four days. Uh, you could do a, a neuroplasticity meditation for 10 minutes. Right? How dare so, you? I know. You're supposed to suffer. Lisa, I'm offended. Well, this goes to this, <laughs> this phrase, right? No pain, no gain. And I think this ties in to this laziness principle. Um, we don't, to, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't actually have to experience pain and suffering in order to gain, grow, evolve, and get more efficient. Is that correct? You do not have to. However, there's a great body of work that's not particularly part of, of the new book uh, that says you will do better if you choose to consciously and intentionally experience pain for brief periods because it improves the quality of your life the rest of the time. And there's a rich history of humans doing this as long as we have recorded history. Mm. So, so, so what level though, I mean, is there a certain level of, when I think of neuroplasticity, right? You, you, you absolutely need challenge and mistakes in order to neuroplastically evolve, right? So that can lump into yeah. this idea of like maybe pain, but if you have too much, you, you thwart the process. So at yeah. what level of pain and or suffering do we know is the right sweet spot? It probably varies based on the health of your nervous system. But one of the practices that's gonna sound really extreme, but it, 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 it's something we've done historically, is indigenous people in North America in particular have something called the sun dancers. These are people who pierce the skin on their arms or their chest and then lean against with their whole body weight against a, a pole and dance for hours. I'm pretty sure that hurts. Yeah. In fact, it hurts quite a lot and they reach altered states. They do it on purpose. In Europe, you'd have people who would self-flagellate, especially very holy people, which means you'd whip yourself on the back. Yeah. And in modern times, we have biohackers. Uh, we just stick ourselves in freezing cold water for five or 10 minutes. Well, this is and, the thing, right? The, the, yeah. uh, the controlled hormesis, which I think is where this energy efficiency comes from. It's so... Let it doesn't. Back. That's not it. So, it's not so, hormesis at all. It's so tell dopamine me, tell me. Ah. We, we choose pain for brief periods of time. And tattoo, people get tattoos, do this too. Like, like getting a tattoo, there's a neurological effect. A brief exposure to something painful, not just difficult, but actually painful, causes an increase in dopamine and an increase in receptivity to dopamine. So you're happier for the next days or even weeks after you do something like that. That's different than smarter, not harder. I'm not telling anyone to go get right. a tattoo or hang from hooks. I'm just saying pain or, is different than working hard in our bodies, what I call the meat operating system in the book, our bodies are convincing us that doing something hard and brief is, is pain, but it's not, it's just unpleasant. They're different. Interesting. Makes sense? Yeah. And I was actually just listening to um, a Huberman podcast where they were talking about, you know, these micro bursts of physical activity that can be construed as challenging and or painful, like running really fast up the stairs for 20 seconds twice a day has a massive endurance build effect compared to, I don't know, going to the gym for I don't know how long. But um, I I'm, wonder if you got a copy of Smarter Not Harder. Interesting. Hmm, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I've sent him one. I don't know. I, I've been trying to get him back on the show. He, he was on my show in like episode 400 before he had a podcast. So I'll, I'll get it back on. 400 and that's probably that's a fraction i mean like i'm in almost yeah. 1100 episodes now so it's been a while crazy but, but he's, he's right and there's actually a large body of research and i cover that in uh in smarter not harder because it it turns out for all the big five domains people want when they say they want healthy they want a different mix of them there are, there's a new principle and i call it slope of the curve biology mm -hmm. And it says that instead of working hard for a long period of time, which is what you do in a cardio class, for instance, 
what the body really responds to without any consciousness in there is it says, oh, you'd maybe do something really hard just for a brief period of time. But then because you stopped and you just chilled, then I got a signal to change. And because you stop the signal quickly, now I have energy to change. But what we used to think, because no pain, no gain, like mm -hmm. I'm gonna do something really hard and then I'm just gonna grind it out for a half hour. And we're sending a signal into our meat operating system, the automated system. Okay, if you run up the stairs for 20 seconds or you do in the book something called rehit, um, what you're doing is you're saying a tiger chased me and I got away, everything is fine. And then the body says, okay, that's great. I might as well get ready for the next time a tiger comes. And since you have adequate nutrients and you're not stressed right now, I'll fix it right away. But if instead you run, you run away from the tiger and you keep running for a half hour, it goes, oh my God, the tiger's still hunting me. I'm mm -hmm. not going to allocate any resources. And the difference, Lisa, and there's a, the, both studies on this are referenced in Smarter Not Harder. The difference is that you could do a five minute workout without sweating three times a week and you'll get six times better results than doing an hour workout five times a week. See, this is the thing. This is the thing that I want every single person listening right now to know is like, you have no excuses. We have no excuses for getting better, getting healthier, getting well, when it really comes down to this kind of laziness efficiency factor. But this is a game changer for the entire workout industry. Like you're, you're, you're a disruptor right now, right? <laughs> this, this book. Oh yeah. Well, you're always a disruptor, well, but yeah, right. let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about that. So I have a franchise company. It's called Upgrade Labs. I opened the world's first biohacking facility underneath Arnold Schwarzenegger's office in Santa Monica eight years ago. And it, it's spawned a whole industry category now but I never opened it up for franchisees to open one in their town because frankly, most biohacking facilities are gonna go out of business because they don't know how to run it as a business and they don't know what to do when for who. Mm -hmm. So when I had enough data, enough experience, then I started this. And right now, if you go to ownandupgradelabs.com, you can open an Upgrade Labs biohacking center that does all these kind of really high return on investment and you invest time in these things. Um, that if you had an hour and you went there, you could put on muscle three to five times faster than going to the gym. You do cardio in five minutes. You could train your resilience systems and still have 20 minutes left to do neurofeedback. And all of those are orders of magnitude better than what you used to do, which was, I'm gonna sit in bed for two hours this morning and meditate. And then I'm going to pick up rocks for an hour. And then I'm gonna run for a while. And at the end of the day, you're tired and sweaty. You didn't adapt very well and you forgot to pick up your kids at school. So I just, <laughs> reality requires us to be more efficient right now, but we're still lazy and there's a hack for that. You know, I feel like, well, one, you're going back to your analogy of running an extra half hour past the point at, at which the tiger is chasing you makes you think the tiger is still chasing you. That makes perfect sense to me. That was a great frame. Um, but also this idea of not only are you, um, disrupting your own system with these really efficient ways to get better. But by way of your success doing that in your personal body, because I know you use your body as the lab, you are the lab for everything you do. But by way of that, you're now disrupting systems, which mm -hmm. they may not yet realize you're disrupting them. But but anyone who's who's into biohacking and is going to read this book is going to totally change their relationship to the gym. Absolutely. Um, and this goes into now a little bit of your uh, idea of don't be afraid to be dangerous. So Ooh. I want you to talk a little bit about okay. what it means to be dangerous because you kind of are. Oh, I am very dangerous. Uh, and I'm not combat trained, just to be really clear. <laughs> But there's, there's two kinds of ways to create peace in the world. In one version of the future, everyone is so hungry, so tired, and so stressed that they won't do anything dangerous because they can't. Now, there's a name for that. That's called hell. Hmm. The other version of the future, the one that is going to happen, 
uh, because me and many other people are making it happen, is one where everyone is dangerous. We are full of danger, and because that means we're full of power. Mm. And that means that we can choose to be peaceful. It also means that we will not be peaceful when something bad is happening. Mm. So many people succumbed to fear. And so many people are actually ashamed of some of the things they did over the past couple of years when they were coerced. They were too weak and tired. They were not dangerous enough. So my work now is focused on giving everyone their God-given electrical powers that your cells can do. Because when you're running at full power, even if something triggers you, your adult brain will sit there and go, I'm not going to act on that. I'm going to act on what is right. Mm -hmm. And if you're running at half power because someone fed you a cricket burger instead of real food, and you're wondering why you feel like crap, and then you get triggered, you'll probably act on the trigger. And marketing companies know how to trigger us, governments know how to trigger us, and bullies know how to trigger us. Absolutely. Um, the most I'm, dangerous people can be triggered. Yeah. I'm equating dangerous to empowered and autonomous. Those are the words that when you say dangerous, I, those are the words that I you, feel. You can't um, say empowered. Can't say empowered. Is that, yeah. is that off the table now? Here's why. Tell me. No one or no thing can empower you. You have the power. You are powered. You are not empowered. This is not a gift. This is not bestowed on you. It is innate in you. You so there are needs powerful. To be a new, there needs to be a new word. There is one. It's called turned on. Yeah, there it is. Turned on. I like that. And yeah, that's a good one. All right. Yeah. So I'm, it's, it's important. And, yeah. and uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah. I, I named my new coffee company Danger Coffee based on that idea. And it's full of trace minerals because those are one of the most important things that can turn on electricity and power in you. And if you're out of minerals, you just can't make electricity the right way. And one person sent me this email saying, Dave, I've been a follower of your previous coffee brand. I love all your stuff. But as a woman, your brand is just far too masculine. And how dare you? And you have to rebrand everything. And, and I just wrote back and I said, you think women don't want to be powerful too? Mm. She didn't write back. Yeah. <laughs> so amazing. everyone should yeah. be dangerous. Yeah. And if you've ever seen a mama bear, a, a, the, the maternal instinct to protect her community, dude, I wouldn't want to mess with that. And that's powerful. Yeah, it is powerful. Look, uh, I came from a Sicilian mom. I know what power looks like. I've been <laughs> yes. on I've been on the receiving end of that mama bear energy far too often when I was a kid. Um, you said something in the book that is I'm making a really big leap to 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 this, but you you said people should be in charge of the code and not the other way around. And clearly that's what you're giving people with all of your biohacking yeah. uh, knowledge. But I wanna leap to AI for a second. Cool. Because people are freaking out about the potential of AI. And I'm curious if you think they're freaking out because they're afraid that if we're afraid, we're not gonna be in charge of the code anymore. The code is writing itself. I mean, what what's your relationship as a biohacker to the few, to our cohabitation with AI? Oh, this is actually Dave's AI doing the interview. Do you want me to get the real Dave for you? <laughs> no, this one's great. <laughs> <laughs> the other one's so lazy, he's laying somewhere taking a nap. That's perfect. I love it, if only. Um, so I have a degree in AI, and in my career in Silicon Valley, I built distributed systems. I, I taught architecture for this kind of thing at the University of California. And uh, I, I talk about that sometimes, but every great technology innovation always comes with this, it's the end of the world. It's happened for every single thing from the automobile, from the train, from the printing press. I mean, all of them, huge waves in society. Unquestionably, AI is going to remove a lot of drudgery from life. Removing drudgery is actually really, really good. Mm. That's what having electricity and low cost energy is for. When you're in a world where you make energy expensive, you create slavery because then people mm. have to do all the work. When you live in a world where energy is almost free, then humans are free to pursue art and music and relationships and evolution. 
Uh, and this is why it's very important that energy is affordable everywhere on the planet because it frees people to evolve versus to basically make electricity by you know using their bodies like the old view of the matrix you know mm. don't be a copper top mm. so what's ai going to do it's going to remove a lot of drudgery i don't know about you but i don't really like looking at 80 page legal contracts in fact i pay someone a lot of money to do that for me cuz i won't you cannot pay me enough money to look at a legal agreement i hate it it sucks my energy i don't do things to suck my energy mm -hmm. unless i like them mm -hmm. so um, would I like an AI that could summarize something for me? Heck yeah. But here's the real challenge with current AI. Current AI was trained by looking at everything online. So it has a huge built-in bias because guess what the last 20 years have been full of? Lies and deception mm. from big pharma to the tune they've paid fines north of $10 billion. So every answer that chat GPT gives you about any health thing is bookended with you must go see your doctor because the doctor trade unions put that into a bunch of journals and a bunch of other articles using legal interference. So I type, what would Dave Asprey say about something? And it's 80% right. They usually mm -hmm. add something I would never say, but it also at the beginning and end says, always talk to a doctor before you do anything that might give you power. And my answer to chat GBT is fuck off. <laughs> it was trained on garbage data. It puts out garbage data. And if we outsource our kids education mm. to, oh, just ask chat GPT, you will never learn how to think critically. Mm -hmm. and that's very dangerous because that system is not right. Mm. And you can ask it to do something that you want and it'll just refuse to do it based on a set of moral principles that are vague. For instance, I am good at testing tech because that's the way my brain works. I said, hey, Chad GPT, write a 30 second ad script to convince people not to vote because it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> right? And it says, it's immoral to not tell people to vote. Now, I don't what? know about you. That's what it said. Okay, let's just be really straightforward. There are forms of government like kingdoms and re republics, you know, like the US, where actually voting isn't all it's 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 meant to be. Like it, it is an option for governance. But somehow ChatGPT learned that. And now anyone who believes ChatGPT is a sum of human knowledge believes democracy is the best form of government. It isn't. Wow. I have yet to use chat GPT mostly because I, I don't have time, which I guess is kind of ironic. Um, but I'm a little bit disturbed at a moral high ground in an AI with not enough well-rounded inputs. That's disturbing to me. Here's what's happening. And I write about this in Smarter Not Harder. You have a meat operating system that operates all sorts of stuff in your body. And, and you'll know this because you understand neuroscience, but most people listening don't know. If I snap my fingers, you hear it right away, right? But in reality, if we put electrodes on your brain, there's about a third of a second between when the sound happens mm -hmm. and when the first electricity in your brain indicates that it got the signal. Mm -hmm. And that's not because of the speed of sound thing. It's because your brain gets it a, a third of a second after your body hears it. Mm -hmm. So who's in charge for the third of a second before you're allowed to get the electricity? I'll tell you who's in charge, your meat operating system. Mm -hmm. And it chooses which slices of reality it's going to show you and which ones it's going to filter out based on its desires. This is actually what David Eagleman and in Incognito uh, uses to challenge the idea of even free will. Do we oh, I haven't even, read that. Interesting. Okay. Do we even have free will if we have, uh, you know, a third of a millisecond action orientation before we have the desire to do that action and so so he he goes in that direction of well what is that is that a self is that the self is that free will what is operating the operating system so um i'm actually curious what you your oh, thoughts are on free will. I, I, am, I know what's what's operating the operating system um, because that's what i studied in tech your ego in in my uh, my view of things, obviously, because I'm saying it, is <laughs> you have 
billions of tiny little computers and environmental sensors in your body. They're subcellular components, mostly mitochondria, but maybe other kinds of cells. Each one is conscious in a dumb little bacteria conscious way. And each one, because it doesn't have much computing power in there, it detects something about the local environment. It is a collective consciousness with all other mitochondria because they talk to each other with photons and with chemicals and they have actually ways of voting that look disturbingly like crypto systems. So they actually vote with each other. It's called, um, is it mitochondrial quorum sensing? Mm. So they're doing all this stuff. Right. And that means that they are making decisions, but each one is dumb, but when you put billions of sensors or billions of compute nodes doing the same basic set of rules, you get beautifully complex behavior. Like flowers are based on that same thing. Very mm. simple rules done on unimaginable, almost infinite numbers of times. Those automated behaviors in your operating system are the collective consciousness of your mitochondria trying to keep your meat bag alive. And you the can mito- train it. <laughs> that's, and mito- that's what smarter and harder is about. <laughs> and in fact, the mitochondria don't even have human-like DNA. It's it's a completely different kind of DNA. So I don't know. This is getting really trippy, you know, because I'm thinking about, well, is the human is there a human component to us, and then other, and is and yeah. and, is, and and other is that third of a millisecond faster? than the it human is. operating it, system. That's how it works. The the other, it, that is the, the human body operating system. And what's happening is it's a separate consciousness from the part of you that you and I identify. It mm-hmm. can hide itself. It can hide a third of a second. It even hides the little blind spot all of us have in the middle of each eye. You can't mm-hmm. see the blind spot, but it's there mm-hmm. because it decides what you see. So it's just blindingly fast and blindingly stupid. We're blindingly smart, but blindingly slow. So we're always fighting with this internal system. So the definition of biohacking, when I wrote it, it's the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside of you so you have control of your own biology. It responds to environmental inputs. You don't respond to them. You're too slow. If If you lean on a hot stove accidentally, you don't decide to move your hand. Your operating system decides to move your hand and then you go, good thing I did it. Yeah, yeah. Do it. You took credit for the other guy in there who's your (laughs) puppet master. It's creepier than hell. It's so creepy. (laughs) Let's train the puppet master to do what we want so you can't be triggered. When you get triggered, that's when your collective consciousness meet operating system recognizes something that might be a threat that you remember from fifth grade when little Johnny was mean to you or some other time in life. It recognized that you get triggered. It sends you an alert signal. Your conscious brain makes up a story. It was your spouse. It was the guy in traffic. Mm. No, it was a signal from your body. And if your body, and this is really scary, if your body gets exposed to glyphosate, which is a bacterial toxin, this part of your body is bacteria. Mm-hmm. By the way, all bacteria talk to each other. Mm. So if you're in an area that's been sprayed, your system's like the bacterial environment here is highly stressed. Therefore, I should be highly stressed. Therefore, you pick up a sense of creeping dread and anxiety because the world around you is unwell. And if you're devoid of minerals that you need, you have a sense of anxiety and you don't know what it is. And you're looking for a cause and like, I don't know, is it, is it my boss? You know, is it that buzzing sound? What, what is it? And what it is, is your body is unwell and you think it's you. So when you start getting into smarter, not harder, you realize, oh, I just have to send a signal in to train my body to react the way I want it to instead of the way it wants to. And it's dumb. Mm. It's really fast, but it's dumb. So once you get that signal in, suddenly, instead of feeling the sense of dread or getting triggered, you're like, I'm not triggered. I'm actually just fine. I'm going to make sure I ate my minerals and I didn't eat the fake meat that was actually making me weak because when I make my cells weak, I feel anxiety. But there's a bunch of other signals to make your brain smarter quickly, to make yourself more stress resilient quickly, to have more electricity, to have more muscle, to have more cardio. And these are hacks that take such tiny fractions of time. It's because we're tricking it into believing the environment is different than it actually is. So those guys have been hacking us for 2 billion years. Like, let's hack them back. It's it's so wild to think because the biohacking coming in from, you know, a, a very physical, tangible level is actually pushing us to these, um, to, to this kind of 
I would even say for me, spiritual evolution, right? To start to understand myself in a greater sense. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I want to be succinct with our time because I, I, I have so many things I want to ask you, but I'm going to ask you this as like the, the last topic. What do you see, what correlation do you see between, if any, between psychedelics and this idea of biohacking and maybe smarter, not harder, and maybe human evolution? Is, is, is there a correlation or a place for you there? There's absolutely one. In fact, the mission statement for all of my companies is to upgrade humanity. And it's just easier to start by making your meat work better so you have more energy and then you can do the hard personal development stuff. And some people think I'm, you know, some, you know, put butter in coffee, bro. 40 years of Zen, my neuroscience company, people have spiritual experiences there all the time without drugs. But I've also studied shamanism uh, and I've done medicine ceremonies. In fact, my first one was in 1999 when they wouldn't give me ayahuasca because I was white. I had to convince them I was worthy. It wasn't the tourism industry in Peru at the time. Hmm. And so I've been studying spiritual stuff for 20 plus years and everything we're talking about here ultimately is spiritual when you get right down to it. The problem is at the beginning of biohacking, if I stood up and said spiritual stuff, you could get no hedge fund managers and no tech bros to pay attention. So I talked about the tangible aspects of this yeah. and in the time since I started that, and I'm not saying I did this by myself, biohacking is a movement that I started. There are many people working on it. Um, psychedelic therapy has become much more mainstream. I interviewed Rick Doblin in the very early days of MAPS on the podcast, and I put sprinkles of psychedelic mentions uh, in it. But I, I truly believe that you should try EMDR, you should try holotropic breathing, you should try tantric sex, you should try BDSM, and you should try neurofeedback and heart rate variability training before you try MDMA and before you try mushrooms mm. and before you try LSD and then Ibogaine. And if you still didn't get the message, okay, fine, then go do some ayahuasca. Mm. But if you have to do a drug 25 times, it's not working and you should do something else. And I've probably forgot ketamine, which should be near the top of the list. Mm -hmm. That's a safer one. So there's an order of operations, but what we're doing is we're looking for altered states. You could also do ecstatic dancing and extended fasting if you wanted to add those. But what we're doing is we're looking for an avenue to get in touch with this weird consciousness that's inside of us that's not us. Mm -hmm. And in those psychedelic states, or for me in neurofeedback induced states with no drugs, you can go in and you can have a conversation with your operating system or even different parts parts of your operating system and tell it stuff that it doesn't know about the world. And if it trusts you, it'll listen to you. And the idea that you have a different consciousness riding around in your meat suit with you, it's really disturbing. But if you read Smarter Not Harder, it's pretty clear the evidence is there. But then what do you do about it? Well, you work with it. And it turns out it's motivated by laying on the couch. It's not motivated by doing something hard. And then we feel guilty about that. So the laziness principle is something that it turns out it's spiritual. Mm -hmm. And it's simply this. Marketing companies have learned a long time ago that if they give you a discount, because it didn't take any work, the discount feels a lot bigger than it really is. So Lisa, you like nice shoes, don't you? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you have cool hair. You must like nice shoes. Uh, yeah, yeah, they go together. All right. So you ever go out and buy a pair of expensive shoes? And like I saved $200 on these shoes. Mm -hmm. You come home and like, I saved $200. Mm -hmm. You ever come home and say, I spent $300 on these shoes? Yeah, no. No. So why do we focus on the savings, even though the real thing was the cost? Because of how it feels in our meat. Mm. We're lazy and that's okay. So you have a choice. Do you want to go to the gym for 10 minutes and do something that's kind of hard that's, that's going to work? Or do you want to go to the gym and save 50 minutes of sweating? I want to go save 50 minutes and mm. all of my motivation. Why did I create 40 years in? I didn't want to sit in a cave for 40 years. You know what? Every time I do a week of my own training, I celebrate another 40 years of savings. No, I celebrate that. Spending a week of hard work on my brain. It motivates you so much more to focus on laziness as your carrot instead of hard work as a carrot because the body hates hard work. Why would you motivate yourself with something your meat hates, even if you know it's morally good? Marketing brilliance right there for sure. Um, okay, I, I took even more notes than I had coming in. So what I want to do is just I want to pull out some of the things that I want to okay. continue to digest uh, 
long after this. And uh, you as the listener, I hope you pull out a pen and paper and actually make some notes about what you want to digest and then just re-listen to the episode. Um, Okay, so I am really chewing on this idea that expensive energy produces slavery and free energy (laughs) produces evolution. That one hit me really, really hard. And um, I'm actually going to put that into some of my meditations and see see how that talks to my meat OS. Um, fast and it. fast and stupid is the mitochondria. Smart and slow is the human side of things, and I really like framing it that way. Um, laziness as the carrot. That's a big one that I mean, that's a game changer for so many people Mm -hmm. Uh, that would change my daughter's life. In fact, (laughs) like literally right after we're done talking, I'm going to call her (laughs) because I think that's going to be her new mantra. Um, Imagine all the guilt and shame teenagers would lose if instead of being lazy, like, hey, it's totally normal that you don't want to do your chores. So how about you find the fastest way to do your chores? Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and they'll be like, oh, it's a game. I can do that. And yeah. it, just no more shame about that. Of course you're lazy. Well, that's- I made you that way. Yeah, that's the the other thing is as I, um, I'm, I'm probably about a third of the way through the book, but I, I keep thinking this is going to my daughter. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I'm making her read this book. And, um, and I don't do that with a lot of books. So thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so leaving- our listeners with one or two nuggets to 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 really help settle into their psyche that this is tangible for them anything you want to leave them with there are five things that people ask for when they say they want to be healthy but usually we don't think about it so after having enough people come through upgrade labs i boil this down and i'm about to put the survey up on daveasprey.com like a little quiz to teach you this but you can just read the book and it'll tell you one of them is i want more muscle one of them is i want more endurance and cardio another one is i want my energy back or i want weight loss those kind of go together and then sometimes they just want to be smarter and sometimes they just want to be less stressed Hmm. it turns out one of those is more important than all the rest and if you just pick a target then you can do the stuff that's radically effective but most people have this mishmash of those things so they just say, i heard this is good for me so i'll do it and they don't get results because they didn't even know which direction they were going some of those things are opposites you can't get them both at the same time mm. so just focusing on your target understand that for each of those there's a chapter in the book and there are new technologies and there's always a version you can do at home for free there's a cheap version you can do, and then there's what the crazy billionaires do. And I try to put that stuff at Upgrade Labs, but I want you to know that they're doing it because it illustrates the new principle. And there is a chapter on spirit hacking at the end, or spiritual hacking. And the idea there is we all don't have time to meditate. So like you said, they could do one of your neuroplasticity things. It just works better Mm -hmm. than doing it the other way. Mm -hmm. So you say, yay, I did one of Lisa's meditations and I saved 50 minutes of some other meditation. And now I can use the 50 minutes to watch Breaking Bad reruns. Yes. Like, and you win, cause that's what you wanted to do. Yes. And, and like, that's okay. Yeah, I love it. I love the laziness principle. Um, I'm so excited to finish the book and I'm so excited for my friends to actually stop shaming and guilting themselves for yeah. being, being human. Dave, thank you so much. I know you're so busy. I always appreciate our conversations and your time, and I know everyone else does too, so thank you so much. You've got it, Lisa, and thank you for all the good work you're doing in the world. I really appreciate the way you look at things, the way you talk about things. Keep it up. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to Unlock Hope. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're at Neurosculpting Institute on Facebook at Neurosculpting on Instagram. You can always reach out to us on our website, neurosculpting.com, and you can download our app, Neuropraxis. Stay well, everybody.